We have caused them to discern between the unclean and the clean, for the godly and the holy. We have a mission. We have a mission called Pure on Earth, and that is to teach people the difference between what is going on out there right now in the world and the difference between that and the holiness of God. And the, and the, the power of God, the power of God in our midst is greater than all these things. We need to teach people that so they have that same kind of faith that they can hold up the banner of God high and say, this is who our God is. That is not our God. We are so much rioting and so much evil going on in the world right now that is heart sickening sometimes. You turn on the news and it's just like, I saw all the rioting here in Portland and that people and, and others. I don't know who I don't know who started what and I don't care. It's just that Satan makes sure that evil happens and he's going to use whoever that he that is willing, whoever that he can. And a lot of this comes from children not being taught right from the time that they're little and growing up. All kinds of problems that, that can take over a person's mind and their thoughts and cause them to do evil. But these evil spirits are out there, but they're going to cease and desist. We are born again Christians, and we need to know who we are. We are kings and priests unto God, and we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And we do have the power and authority over all the enemy. We have power and authority in all the principalities and powers of the air. That's all of Satan's powers, all of Satan's evil demons, and all of those that that hold, stand against God. We have powers over all of it because of Jesus gaining that victory on the cross. Whenever he gained that victory, that victory came right on down to us. That's part of our salvation. That's part of what he did for us on the cross. That he gave us victory over the enemy. And we need to act like we have it. Amen. We have to be who God says we are. And, we have to, and, and before we can do anything, we have to be who we are. You have to be saved. You have to be a holy person. You have to be a righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You have to know who you are before you can do good works. A lot of people talk about works, how the works don't mean anything, because it's not what works that we're saved. We're, we're saved by uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, and it's true, we are. But he also commanded us to do good works. Uh, so love is not just a feeling, it is what we do. Well, a lot of people think love is just a feeling. You feel erotic about something, blah, 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 blah. But it's what you do with that love that makes, makes you do things for other people, makes you show kindness to other people, makes you pray for other people. That's what love is. Makes you help somebody whenever they're in need. Whenever you see somebody downcast or somebody that has a need, it causes you to want to help them. You will go to whatever length that you have to go to to help that other person attain whatever it is that they need because they're in trouble. So to the key to do this is to be empowered with God's love. We know that we have to be empowered with his love, and the only way we can be empowered with his love to be absolutely born again and know who we are and know that God is in our hearts, know that he's running and ruling our life, that he is leading and guiding us into all truth. That's the holy job of the Holy Spirit. And you can't separate the spirit of God from from Jesus or from the Father. It's all one spirit. It's all one spirit. The Father is one is a spirit, and you have to worship in the spirit and the truth. Jesus Christ also has the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of God. So we have to just, they're all God. It's all one God, but different characteristics of one God. So I want to look at an example in the Bible of someone that had the same kind of love, the same kind of love that Jesus had. You probably all know who it is. It was Paul. Paul endured a lot of things just in order to get the word of God out there. God gave him a mandate whenever he was first saved, when he was sitting right there, and Ananias was praying over him. And, and Ananias had told the Lord, says, God, I don't know about this man. He has been killing people. He's been taking and arresting people and having them all executed in your name. Because I don't know about him. I don't know if I want to go in there and, and even speak to this man or not. He said, you go because it's a servant of mine. And I'm showing the great things you must suffer for my name's sake. So God had a, had a plan for Paul from the beginning, and he knew he was going to have to do a lot of suffering in order to accomplish his plan. And we also have to realize that we're not going to get out of this world without any suffering, because it is what the enemy does, and God is not going to hold back the enemy's hand of doing a certain amount of things in this earth. However, he's going to give us the power to overcome. And that is what we have to do. We have to learn that we have an enemy in this world, but he's given us the power to overcome him. Mm -hmm. Here in 2 Corinthians 12, 2-4, Paul says, 
And I have this in the NLT. Sometimes I like to do Greek and NLT because it talks a little bit more the way we understand things today. He said, I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. But I do know that I was caught up into paradise. And I heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words. Things that no human is allowed to tell. I think that heaven is so great that it is and people that have gone there and come back and witnessed what they saw, they said it's indescribable. You cannot even describe the colors and the great and awesome things. Now, Paul was caught up to the third heaven. That's right where the throne of God is. And no telling what things that he saw. But they were so mighty that they made an impression on his mind. And that impression on his mind gave him something to hang on to whenever all these troubles came. Gave him something to hang on to that he knew that that was going to be his final destiny, and that he would do anything on earth necessary because whenever he, would, he was finally going to reach that destiny, that would be worth it all. We have to have that same kind of vision within ourselves and that same kind of focus, and know that no matter what we go through on this earth, that we are going to have a final, final resting home that's going to make it worth it all. Did you have a question back there? Um, Read that scripture again because there was a lot of confusion back here. Alright. Uh, Second Corinthians 13, 2 through 4. I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside of my body. But I do know that I was caught up in paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words. Things no human is allowed to tell. You can maybe not be able to put words to it, but Paul had that vision embedded in his mind for the rest of his life. He had that vision embedded in his mind. You know, there was a time, one time, that I also was caught up, I would say, into the very presence of the love of God. I never saw anything, but I'm telling you, just that feeling of his presence. I remember I was standing behind the pulpit getting ready to give my testimony, when suddenly I was out of my body and I was just going through the roof. There was no, there was no, nothing between me and where I was going. And I just wanted to keep going. It was like a magnet. That love was so powerful, it's totally indescribable. It's totally indescribable. The love of God is something Amen. that none of us cannot experience here on earth because it's right just finite people. And and God is just so so infinite in how much and greatness and mighty that there's no no way to describe his greatness, no way to describe his love. And that love has stayed with me all of my life and I have I've asked him actually for another experience of things. <laughs> Sometimes I felt I had at the time I wanted to just keep going. And my children were little at the time and my husband was at home and I said and, and I had no thoughts of anybody else. Nothing else in my life mattered. I didn't want to go back to my children. I didn't want to go back to my husband. I didn't want to go back to this world. I just wanted to keep going. It was, it was just like a back to the way. But suddenly, suddenly, I was back to my body. And, it was, and that, that, any kind of a experience that you have like that, just your experience of salvation, I I believe he gives every one of us something, something that we can hang on to in times of trouble and say, yes, God, there's no doubt in my mind that you are real. Because you know, Satan will try to come to you and say, hey, this is nothing but a fairy story. That's a fairy tale. God is not really real. We have to realize he is so real. And this is, this is reality. And God will give you all something if you will look for it, if you will reach out for it. God will give you something to hang on to in times of your trouble that you will say, this is going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it for my eternal home. It's going to be worth it to see Jesus. Jesus is my great reward. Jesus is the one that I'm longing for, that I'm going to spend the rest of eternity with, and it will be worth it all. And so that's why that Paul could actually lay down his head on that guillotine and say, let her fly. You know, that's it. <laughs> Thank you.
Corinthians 1, 8 to 11, Paul is talking about some of the things that happened to him while here on earth, and he endured them gladly, I think, for the joy that was set before him, just like Jesus did when Jesus was on the cross. For him to be able to endure the pain and the disgrace of the cross, and the humility, and everything that came with it, and even the demons of hell, I believe, and in the spirit, they were all rapping at him and yelling at him, you're defeated now, ha, 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 see what we did to you, and they were just really railing on him, trying to discourage him, and making him feel like that everybody had forsaken him, that the Father had forsaken him, that everybody had forsaken him, and he was nobody. The devil does that to us sometimes, trying to make us feel that we were worthless, that we're worthless, we're of no value, and that we don't even deserve to even live on this earth. I believe that's why we have suicides a lot of times. That people get so discouraged, they think that my life is not worth anything. I might as well just kill myself. And I think that that's what happens to them. But because uh, of what Jesus did for us on the cross, he knew what was ahead of him. He knew where he had been. He knew his heavenly father. He knew had been in heaven before, and he knew what heaven was, the reality of heaven. But more than that, he had a mission, and his mission was to save the world. His mission was to save the world, and he was the only one that could do it. The only one that could do it. He was the only sinless person, the only one that had the spirit of God in him, and the only sinless person that could redeem the world, and he was up to, the, up to it. And he said that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. I believe that Paul, for that the joy that was set before him, he endured all the trials and the problems in his life while he was here on earth. Here in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 11, in the NLT again, it says, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble that we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. What is your beyond your ability to endure? It's like you are just absolutely feel wiped out. We got we thought we would never live through it. Have you ever been in a situation like that? I have before. I think probably most of us at some time or other in our life have been where God I can't even make it through this. There's no way I'm gonna make it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves. And we learned to rely on God who raised the dead. And he did rescue us from all all moral danger. He will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us. And you are helping us by praying for us. Then many people will give thanks because God has graciously answered so many prayers for our safety. So they knew they had to rely on God, and we have to do the same thing. When you get at a point where you just feel like there is no way out of a situation. There was one time I was in such a situation that I... I, just, I felt like I was in a trap in a situation where there was absolutely no doors, no windows, and I didn't know how I'm going to get out of it. Uh, but here I am. And I don't know how I got out of it. But somehow, I did. That's because I could not, I could not not trust God. You know, once you know what God has done for you, there is no way, no way you can turn your back on it. We cannot ever turn our back on God and say, God, why did you allow me to get in this mess? It's because he wants you to learn. He wants you to learn to be patient and know that there is a light on the other side. There is a light on the other side, and it's going to be worth it all. So when Paul said he will continue to rescue us, he showed that he was not giving up. So no matter how times that he would have to suffer near death, his love for people and to hear the gospel message is what kept driving him forward. It kept pressing him on. He kept going to all the churches. He kept starting new churches in different places, and no matter what, even some people from his own, of his own race, other Jews that were supposed to be Christians, other Jews even came against him. They would follow him from place to place and try to turn the people against him, thinking that he was teaching them wrong because of who he had been before, and maybe they remember that, and also because he was not teaching them that they had to be circumcised and obey all the law of Moses. You know what? There's a lot of people that get their gospel wrong, and because of that, they might turn against you. They might even say that your, your religion is wrong, your Christianity is wrong, because you're not thinking right, you're not doing the right things. There's a lot of people out there that believe that there's a lot of do's and don'ts in the church, and you have to adhere to them or you can't even be a Christian. You can't get there because you're not doing the things that they feel like is the things you have to do. We know that this is not a doing and don't religion. This is a faith religion. This is believing in God and trusting in Him. 
and the church needs to break down these walls, these walls of do's and don'ts, and these walls of, of uh, things that things that are just um, what do I want to call it? Uh, whatever. Well, they're just they're what? Yes, it's bondage for sure. Yeah, but a lot of them are just doctrines of devils. A lot of them are doctrines are not doctrines of God, but they're doctrines of. A lot of people have to feel like they have to be helping God. And these do's and don't religion, I always say, is something that you feel like it gives you justification. You feel like, oh, well, if I can pride myself in this, if I suffer, and if I don't do this, and if I don't do that, and everything, God will, will see that I'm a more righteous person. It's not the way it works. He doesn't look at all of our do's and don'ts. He doesn't look at how, how, how thin our dress is. He doesn't look how short our dress is. He doesn't look at what we're wearing or what we're doing or how we're wearing our hair or how long our sleeves are. Exactly. 
2 Corinthians 6, 3 through 12 in the NLT. He says, we live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us. And that's the way we all have to live. Let, let us not ever be a stumbling block to anyone. And that no one will find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We have been beaten, been drunk, put in prison. We faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. We prove ourselves our, uh, by our purity, our understanding, our patience, and our kindness by the Holy Spirit within us and by our sincere love. Paul did not love. We faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack and the left hand for defense. We serve God whether people honor us or despise us. He had made up his mind he was going to serve God whether anybody else liked it or not. Whether people liked him or loved him or didn't like him or whatever or was ready to put him in prison or ready to try to kill him. He didn't care he was going to continue to serve God. What boldness he had. He says whether they slander us or praise us, we are honest but they still are, but they call us imposters. We are ignored, and even though we are well known, we live close to death, but we are still alive. Praise God. You know, God's got a mission for you. I believe he'll keep you alive. Do you complete it? I really do. I believe he'll keep you alive. Do you complete it? And they can and take you out. There's a lot of people right now saying that there's an assassination attempt on Trump uh, almost, almost every other day or so. There's been at least 12 major attempts on his life already. But as long as God has a mission for him, it's going to keep him alive till he finishes that mission. I don't know what exactly the, the length of that mission is going to be. Only God knows. But God will do whatever he'll do. And the same thing for you. He's got a mission for you and a purpose for you to be alive. He, you will live until you complete your mission. So we have been beaten, he says, but we have not been killed. Our hearts ache, but we always have joy. Wow. The keep having joy in the middle of all of this, all of this. His heart aching, he still has joy. We are poor, but we give spiritual riches to others. We own nothing, and yet we have everything. Oh, dear Christian friends, we have spoken honestly with you, and our hearts are open to you. There is no lack of love on our part, but you have withheld your love for us. Paul loved them, whether they loved them in return or not, and we have to do the same thing. We run across people all the time that maybe even hate us, but we have to still try to show love and kindness towards them, no matter what we do. You know, one year there was a, there was another food bank that had trouble coming up with another enough uh, gift cards or food or Thanksgiving baskets. It was in another town, another area, for the people at Thanksgiving. So they were just not going to be giving them anything. It was an announcement in the paper. So I thought, well, you know what? God is really blessed this. I think I'll just send them some money to help them. They can at least go buy a bunch of gift cards to these people. Because turkeys were selling really cheap at that time. You could also buy a turkey for five bucks. There have been times when they've been that low. And so I sent them about a thousand dollars. And a few days later, I got back to the mail and said, I don't need your help, but I don't want your money. Wow. wow. Oh. So you know what? Um, and that's, that's an experience that Paul had here. Wow. And he was trying to help and do good for other people, and they despised him anyway. They still did not love him, no matter what he did. There's times when you try to do a kindness to other people, and they just throw it back in your face. Just keep on. Do not become discouraged. Just keep going on. I just pray for them that God's blessing will be on them anyway, because they're still trying to do what they need to help people. Do you think that there are times when Paul might have returned to the church yet? I think there does. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Take me home, Lord. Thank you. you know what? There's even been times in my life, up until now, that I say, God, I'll be back to you all ready to go home. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. Sometimes we get some tired physically. I'm keeping on, keeping on. My dad used to always say that. You know, no matter what, no matter what happens, you just have to keep on, keep on. You put one foot in front of the other, and you'll get there. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And I think of that sometimes, every time when my feet get so tired and weary, I have a hard time putting one in front of the other. That's what keeps me going sometimes, is those words of my father that keep coming back to me. It's amazing the things that you know from people that have told you things, how they keep coming back to you. Another thing that he used to always say, 
would never let us sleep past 7 o'clock in the morning. He said, you know, sleep your life away. So there's things to do, things to get up and to take care of, things to do, you know, to sleep your life away. We always had to be up by 7. To this day, I cannot sleep beyond 7 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't have all my life money. I have ever slept beyond 7. Most of the time, I get up around 5 or so. But it's just, that was it. Those things have become great to you. We need the Word of God in us to be doing yes. great things like that. But every time we start to do something that's against the Word of God, but that little word pops into our mind and says, Nope, here is thus saith the Lord. Yes. yes, we have to abide by that. And you know, actually, that does happen to me quite often. It does happen to me. You know, I learned the Word of God whenever I was a child, even. Um, did a lot of memorizing in my teen years. This particular church we went to was very challenging, and they were always encouraging us to memorize the Word. And I thank God for it. But after I became a Christian and really became to know him personally, this word of God was still there. It was still there. And uh, many times the Holy Spirit would bring it back to my mind at a time when I needed to know it. Because a lot of times as a child, they not memorize scriptures. They may not really fully understand them at the time they memorize them. But once they're inside of you, they will stay there yes. forever. And the Holy, they're, they're there for the Holy Spirit to bring yes. back to your remembrance. And then with a clearer understanding of it at the time that you need it, but if there's not ever there, he can't bring it back to your remembrance. So we need to get those words in us so he can. Yeah. So I think that Paul did many times probably say, Lord, I don't know about this. I don't know about this life. I think I'm about ready to go home here. And uh, God would say, you can do it, Paul. You can do it. Keep going. And Philippians 1, 23 to 25 says, you're talking about what he's talking about. It. He says, I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far greater for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live, knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive, so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of the faith. So he had that determination to keep doing what it was that God had called him to do. And I believe that God gave him that glorious experience for just that reason. That at times when he thought he was going to die, times he thought he couldn't put one foot in front of the other, times he thought he just could not go on, he continued to go on because God to give him that message to do. And he had to complete it before he went back to heaven. So he longed to go to be with Christ, but he was willing to stay and help all those that needed him. And he continued to love him. And it was for that great joy. He had a great joy in his spirit all the time. Even though he might have been very at a, at a time when he's very tired, very broken. I have a feeling that Paul probably had a lot of aches and pains with all that he went through, the beatings that he suffered. He suffered many, many beatings throughout his life. So I don't remember exactly. How many times did he say five times that he was beaten, almost at four strikes? And that was, a lot of people, that, that beating would have killed him. And Paul well, was able to endure it because God said, you're still going forward. And we have to continue on. 2 Corinthians 12, 15 says, And I will very gladly spend, and this is Paul speaking, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more I abundantly I love you, the less I am love. So no matter what, he was willing to actually spend his life for these people, to be absolutely spent by them. To be spent, I believe, is at the point where you feel like your body is absolutely to the point of not even taking another step. Just lying down and just quitting. That lying down and quitting reminds me of one time when I was working in a shop. And there was a girl there that, she had been working a lot of long hours and, and, and had to stand up to kind of work in the mood like she was standing up and we were standing up and working and everything. And she said, I'm so tired and she just laid flat down on the floor with her arms out. And right at that time, the boss <laughs>
He never knew whether the things that he was doing for others out of love would cause them to change or to love us in return, but he did them anyway. Sometimes we have to be like that. We don't know whether it's going to help them or not, but we just have to continue doing what God has called us to do, not worry about where it falls. We are seed sowers in this earth, and I believe that love is a seed. Love is like a seed that we sow that in people's hearts. And if they receive it, they mature and they grow. They don't receive it, it's not it's, it's not on you for the sake of them. God is always looking for people to stand in the gap. I told a woman one time, she was talking about her mother, her sister, and she was the only one in her family that was a Christian. She was got so weary sometimes. And I said, well, just thank God that mm -hmm. there's somebody in your family standing in the gap for the rest of your family members. Mm -hmm. You might be the only family member that is saved. You might be the only one praying for them. But thank God for you because you're praying for them. Mm -hmm. Because they might be lost without that prayer, without that sustained voice. Yes. God is always looking for people to stand in the gap for others. And we need to remember that. Here in Revelation 2, 4 through 5, it says, Nevertheless, this is Jesus talking to John when he was on the Isle of Patmos. He says, uh, he, he just had just been um, talking about the churches, giving messages to all the churches. And this was the message, part, partial, of a message to the church in Ephesus. I'm just trying to not read too much here, but just the part that's, that's perfect. So he says, Nevertheless, I have someone against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Yes. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent, and do the first works. So here, love was something they had to do. They had to do their first works. That was what he called love. He says, Thou hast lost their first love. So how do you retain that back? Go back and do your first works. And what was those first works? It was repenting. It was repenting of your sins, repenting of your lack of passion, repenting of your lack of doing what God has called you to do. And you know, there comes some time in a lot of churches where they get to the place where they just get to where they're comfortable. Their own little group and everything, and everything is going well for them. There's plenty of money coming into the church. Everybody uh, goes and has a good time, hears a good message, sings a lot of songs, and goes home. And I think that people that, especially people that go to church just limitedly, they go to church just to kind of have a, a feeling, a good feeling, because you feel like you're okay, I'm more righteous now because I went to church this morning. You know, they, you may not express it like that, but a lot of people, believe it or not, I think that they have that feeling that I went to church every Sunday, Lord, and, and I, I did this and I did that. Those are the things that God is looking for us to say. He's not looking for those things. And when I was telling you about Bob Taylor, I want to finish that little story right now. He died and he went to heaven. He felt and had so discouraged, he became really depressed and he died and went to heaven. While he was in heaven, he saw this multitude of people. And they said there was a whole big crowd over here of people going one direction. There was a small group over here, probably about 3% of the total of all of them, going in another direction. And he asked the Lord, he said, who are these people? And he said, this 3% over here are going into my presence. They're going in, into eternity with me. And this other section over here is the ones who are headed for destruction. And uh, he said that's because nobody told them that they that they loved them. And he said, told Bob Jones, I'm going to send you back. You need to go back and tell people on earth how much I love them. You need to go back and preach the message of love to these people and say, did you learn to love? He said that was one of the things that he noticed that Jesus did to people that came before him. He kept asking them, did you learn to love? Did you learn to love? Did you learn to love? And did you love others? You know, he asked us, he said, did you feed the hungry? Did you clothe the naked? Did you help the homeless? And did you give even a cup of cold water in my name? These are all things that pertain to helping other people. So love has action to it. And these are the things that Jesus is looking for. He's not looking to all the great works that we do here on earth. He's not looking to all the, the businesses that we start and how we excel in that business and how we do great and wondrous things and how we achieve great finances and, and do all, all things of this world. Uh, that isn't what he's looking for. He's looking about people that they do love. And so he sent Bob Jones back and no, he came back to earth. And then they came back with that message for the people and that's what he began to teach Love. We need to realize that love is a thing that really is going to touch the hearts of other people. Love is a thing that's going to turn the heart of the wicked towards God. 
Love is a thing that's going to cause people to quit sinning and doing what's right if they ever get that in their heart. And all we can do is keep telling them, not only does God love them, but we have to show and demonstrate to them what that love is like. Yes. We're called to be demonstrators of love. We're called to be doers of yes. love, doers of righteousness. We have to show them what love is like. And we have to show it to them, regardless if they're a nice person or not a nice person, if they are a religious person or if they're a wicked, vile sinner, we have to show them love. So those are the things, and there's many people that we come in contact with every single day that need just nothing more than maybe a kind word. If you don't know what else to tell somebody, to say, you know what, I really, I really like that smile. You have such a cheerful smile every day. Are you this or that? Say something nice about it no matter what. Because some people yes. just get up in the morning so discouraged, they just don't know how to keep going. Right. I can't help but think about that woman one time that came to the food bank that was so downcast and so discouraged. She just started railing on me right away. She hadn't even gotten her card yet. She hadn't even applied for a food box or anything. She was with a couple of other women. She came right up there with a chip on her shoulder right off the bat. And she said, "You." and she just started cursing at me and everything. And I just said, I said, I'm sorry, sorry you're having such a bad day. I just hope that hope it gets better. Sometimes you just gotta respond. I could have responded like um uh, or something or told her to get lost or whatever. <laughs> Nice and kind to 
them. How are they going to know that we're different? We're allowed because uh, of, as one of each other says, you don't love my people because of their love for one another and their love for others. And that's not why we even help how people discern who we are. That's how we're going, just by our love. So Matthew, um, well, first of all, I want to read this up here in Ephesians 2.10. But it recalled, called us to do works. Jesus called us to do works. This is what Matthew just about going on here. Okay. In Ephesians 2.10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ yes. Jesus unto good works, yes. which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. This was foreordained, I believe that means before creation, that we were called to do good works. Now, all the good works that a person does if they're not in Christ, if they have not been born again, is going to be totally worthless. Right, yeah. Totally worthless. Because we have to do these good works in Christ. We have to do them in Christ because of His love. So these people that do good works and walk, they have walked in them and do good works, that's how God is going to judge us on judgment day. Did you feed the poor? Did you help the hungry? Did you help those that were homeless? Did you clothe the people that were naked? And Things like that. Those kind of questions are the questions he's going to ask us. So we have to walk in the means that we should make it a way of life for us. It sounds like it was part of God's plan to do good works from the beginning of creation. <clears throat> Matthew 5.16 also says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's another scripture that shows that we should do good works because what we do we're glorifying God in heaven. Whenever people see those good works, they will glorify God. They glorify God until you're there. I get little letters all the time saying how much they appreciate us and how much they appreciate the food bank and everything. That's because they're seeing the good works. And then I can't take all the credit for that. My goodness. You know what? I have grown. I have grown. Um, it's been many years since we started the food bank. But through it all, I have grown more spiritually probably than many of the people, the benefits that the people even receive when they come there. God is doing more in me, more in me, day by day, and every day of my life, he's doing more in me than he's probably doing in anybody else. Because whenever you're a leader, God does not, you have to keep growing. If you're not growing, you're becoming stalemated, and you just can't want to just die where you are if you're not growing. So we have to grow spiritually. Now, I might not be growing well physically, but I'm growing spiritually, and that's what helps me. He already knows these bodies, these temples or tents are going to fall away one of these days. But every one of us, we're not going to live forever. And we might as well realize that we are God said once we get to be 80 years old, you're not going to have a body like a 21 year old. He will complete the work that he's begun in us, 
and it will be. Uh, we will be an example of him by the time we go home to be with the Lord. When we get there, you know there's no, there is no unforgiveness in heaven. There is no aggression in heaven. There is no remembering things on earth and holding anything against anybody in heaven. There is only love. There is only love in heaven and kindness. Uh, this one man that went to heaven one time, his wife was in heaven also, and he died a long time before him. And even though there's no marriage in heaven, but that doesn't mean you can't still be friends with everybody, and you are, even with your exes. You know, they, they, they went to heaven, you're going to be friends with them. You're going to love them. You're not going to remember the things on earth that That's were right. adverse, the things that, that you disagree upon, the reason you've got a divorce. If you both went to heaven, I know that my, my mother, my biological mother, and I had some really strong disagreements one time. And I remember going in and throwing myself on the floor there praying. I said, God, how can this be? We're both Christians. How can this be? What's going to happen when we get to heaven? You know, I used to always think like that. What's going to happen when we get to heaven whenever, when we have so many strong disagreements here? And she just walked out of my house and never want to return again. And, and, and God just... You let me know that there is no there is no aggression in heaven. There is no unforgiveness. You forget all of those things about everybody. You love everybody. And so you still are going to love everybody. You're going to love all your exes. You're going to love all of us. Jesus is the way out. And Jesus will lead them and guide them. 
forgiveness and change your life. I think it is so miraculous how long you can save a life to change it. And I tell people all the time when they're complaining about somebody else or what they did or what they said, I said, just remember, you are not the one that can change their heart. Only God can. You need to pray for them. You need to pray for them. You need to be kind to them. Do whatever you can. Give them the word of God if necessary if they're open to it. But only God can change them. And we need to continue to think like that and let God change their hearts. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in all of our lives, Lord God. The way you lead and guide us, Lord God, in all things. The way that you're with us every day through all of our troubles, Lord. God, help us, Lord, to endure the things of this earth, Lord, while we're here on earth. And to always show kindness to others, Lord, to show your love for us, God, no matter what the circumstances, Lord. To never be hateful or mean or violent toward anybody, Lord, but only to show love, to demonstrate your love, God, to 